Sounds good. Let's get started. Oh, I just want to welcome everyone uh, to the uh, second quarter 2016 America's Hernia Society of uh, Quality Collaborative Call. And um, if you are um, on the phone uh, calling in, if you don't mind just uh, muting yourself, <clears throat> that'll help reduce uh, some of our feedback. Um, Shelby, am I coming through okay? Yep, okay, sounds good. Um, so, again, just want to welcome everyone to the webinar, and uh, we'll just start off with uh, our disclosures. Mike, Rose, and I are going to uh, lead this, but we definitely want this to be um, a pretty active discussion. Um, these are uh, Mike Rosen's disclosures. Um, he's a speaker for VAR Dayval, research support from Gore and Mira Matrix, um, also a consultant to the following uh, companies, and uh, he received support as AHSQC medical director. For myself, um, I re uh, received research support from Bard Dayval, I'm a consultant to Arrest and Pfizer, and I also received support uh, from the AHSQC as my role for uh, Director of Quality and Outcomes. Um, the AHSQC itself, again, I think it's very important to be upfront about this, um, received support from the America's Hernia Society, <clears throat> and also through our uh, foundation partners uh, who have contributed uh, last year, which include LifeCell, Bard Dayval, Insitra Medical, Covidian Medtronic, uh, McKay, and Intuitive Surgical. One final disclosure, um, when Cleveland celebrates something happy, the entire country celebrates, we want to reach out to the Cavs, let everyone know that we're all proud of them. Cleveland now has something to celebrate. We're all very excited. A lot of folks from Cleveland, congratulations. Ben, 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 before you go any further, I just got to take this moment and say, I thought that the Cavs would win before 166 surgeons got together and shared data for hernias, but I was wrong on that too. But I still am tearfully joy joyous that the Cavs won. <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I hope you all are. And any Golden State fans on this call, uh, you had your day. Now it's ours. Back to bed. <laughs> <laughs> Miracles can happen. It's good. Uh, I would ask uh, that uh, – Please no reproduction of this material we were presenting without approval of the AHSQC. Um, we are recording the webinar, um, so you can uh, view it later on, and we'll have you uh, receive instructions on how to do that later on. So the plan for this webinar, um, we're just going to go over uh, what we've accomplished over the past year. Um, I think uh, you'll be overall really pleased with what we've done. Um, and then we're going to kind of talk a little bit about what we need from you as uh, our surgeons and our surgical teams as part of this effort, critical part of this effort, and really where we're going in the next day. So as of uh, December 2013, um, you can see things were pretty sparse. We had just under six, uh, 600 patients, 15 sites, 33 surgeons. Um, well, look what's happened over the course of the next two years. December 2014, December 2015, and then now currently, uh, June 2016, we're just under 10,000 patients, 190 sites, and uh, 166 surgeons, and we're continuing to increase at a, a very, very good pace. Um, we're entering, on average, anywhere from uh, four to 500 uh, patients per month, which is pretty impressive, and uh, things are, are continually expanding. So just to talk a bit about what we have done, I think this is really important because, um, again, what differentiates us from a registry is that we are a collaborative and we want to advance the field, help our patients and help our hospitals, and uh, also work in collaboration with our industry partners to try to improve what we do for patients. So we're going to go over some things that uh, we've accomplished over the past uh, 12, uh, 12 months or so. The first is... Uh, we worked uh, in concert with our AHS Resident and Fellow Committee, which uh, is comprised of David Carpata, Clayton Petro, Jeff Blatnick, Luciano Testaldi, Rebecca Balcom, and Paul Colavita. And um, they put together um, an AHSQC Resident and Fellow Research Grant. Uh, I think we're really proud of this, and we're proud of our Resident and Fellow efforts with this uh, as a mechanism of providing some research support for uh, trainees who are interested in using the QC uh, for research studies. So this is uh, a lot of, uh, we anticipate a lot of submissions and some good work to come out of this. The AHSQC uh, just re received approval as a uh, CMS uh, QCDR vendor. I'll explain what that is in a second here for 2016. Um, 
basically what a QCDR is, and I think this is really, really critical to uh, our sustainability and long-term vision here. Uh, we've established ourselves as a qualified um, clinical data registry, and I just want to remind everyone, um, if you're on the call, we're getting some feedback. If you could go ahead and mute yourself, um, hopefully we can come through okay here. <clears throat> uh, Shelby, let me know. Can you hear me all right via instant messaging? Yeah, it looks like we're coming in okay. Um, give us a second here to try to identify why we're getting some feedback. Okay, yep. Yeah, looks like we got some background noise. I'll try to turn this down a little bit. This might be better. Okay, hopefully everyone can hear me now. Um, so a QCDR is a Qualified Clinical Data Registry. Um, it's basically a CMS-approved registry uh, to report outcomes, um, and it's a, it's a way for professional organizations to develop their own measures for value-based payments, uh, specifically to the uh, Physician Quality Reporting System. And um, this was really a massive effort that was undertaken uh, the latter half of last year and the beginning of this year by all the people um, you see there. And um, basically what we did was um, we defined all the uh, outcome measures that are really pertinent to uh, ventral hernia surgery. Uh, and so what we did was we created eight outcome measures that can be used for value-based payments. And this is going to affect pretty much everyone who does clinical surgery and a high volume of uh, um, hernia surgery. Just to give you a couple of examples of some of the measures we developed. Um, unplanned hospital readmissions or observation within 30 days of the post-op period. And then another one, as an example, is ventral hernia repair with myofascial release, cervical site occurrence requiring a procedural intervention within 30 days of the post-op period. Uh, all of these are available uh, for your uh, view on our website. If you just go to um, our website, go to news, and at the very bottom, there's a link for AHSQC non-PPRS measures. You see the entire list and all the specifications. Um, so what does this mean for you? Well, I think, first of all, what it means is that it establishes hernia-specific outcome measures developed by hernia surgeons who actually operate on patients, not done by uh, administrators not made by other folks who are really removed from patients. Um, and ultimately, um, if your hospital or, or your practice doesn't participate in PQRS as part of CMS, it helps you avoid payment penalties in this upcoming value-based payment model. Uh, I think also importantly, uh, third-party payers um, are going to follow suit from CMS. Uh, and the other thing that's interesting to note is that um, each state is going to do this on a state-by-state -state basis, and they uh, will establish technical advisory groups based on disease processes. And during those discussions, um, someone's going to ask, well, are there any accepted measures for hernia? We want everyone who's familiar with this to say, yes, there is, and they are the AHSQC measures. Um, for more information on this, uh, contact Shelby or myself, but uh, again, I just wanted to let everyone know what else is going on at the HSQC in terms of what we're doing on an app. Um, a brief update uh, from some of the data we presented um, at the AHS meeting um, recently. Uh, we presented some robotic information comparing uh, robotic retromuscular repairs compared to uh, similar open retromuscular repairs. And what we showed was that uh, the uh, length of stay was decreased for the robotic cohort compared to the open cohort. Uh, pretty significantly from about five days for open retromuscular repairs and uh, clean wounds to about just over two days. Well, one um, criticism of this that was uh, brought up uh, on the uh, International Hernia Collaborative, the Facebook site, was that, well, you know, many more TARs were performed in the open, in the robotic group compared to the open group, and this could have uh, confounded the uh, results. And so what we did was um, we went back and uh, we tried to level the playing field a little bit more. These are all matched patients, so we ran what's called a propensity score analysis, where we matched patients on a whole bunch of different factors. And if you look at the results there, on the open patients and the robotic patients, they were actually much more comparable, and the TAR rates were much more comparable as well. We did see some difference, as expected, in the use of retromuscular drains. It just looks like our uh, robotic uh, colleagues just don't use drains as much. and uh, 
based on this new analysis where we were able to kind of even the playing field on the performance of tar, we found the following, that basically the results still held up, uh, that there was significantly reduced length of stay with uh, robotic retromuscular repairs compared to open. It was, uh, the effect was reduced just a little bit from 5.1 days to 4.6 days, but nonetheless still significant. So I think this is just an example of, uh, you know, we presented this data at the AHS meeting, uh, got some feedback about it, we're able to go back and actually reanalyze it, and uh, this is the result you see. Um, another exciting thing that's occurred <clears throat> um, is several of you remember our, uh, we initiated the AHSQC reduction in early readmissions initiative last year. And uh, what you see here is uh, data from 2013 and, and actually 2014, where you see several surgeons and their percent 30 day readmission rates. It, it varied quite a bit. And then uh, when we initially looked at this, we superimposed everyone's volume on there. You can see there are a lot of surgeons who do a uh, high volume of these who are having very low readmission rates. And so we asked that group, well, what are you doing in your practice um, that results in these low readmissions? Well, two themes came out. Um, some people were uh, having folks come in for a clinic visit before their routine 30-day follow-up, for example, to take out staples, that kind of stuff, or like a wellness check. And then some folks were uh, actually uh, calling patients after their discharge within the first week or so, asking specific questions. So. We took that um, information and uh, designed an intervention, the AHSQC Early Readmission Reduction Questionnaire. And then we tracked it. Uh, several of you will uh, see this as a familiar thing. And we basically tracked the fact whether or not the uh, readmission reduction questionnaire was administered. And then was uh, a patient seen either in the clinic or at the emergency room between discharge and the 30-day uh, post-op visit. So basically, uh, we implemented this uh, QI intervention across the HSQC starting in about November 2015. Uh, it was a voluntary participation. Whoever wanted to do it could do it. If you didn't want to do it, that's okay. And the intervention was to administer the questionnaire or come to clinic after discharge, but before that regular 30-day post-op visit. So what I'm going to show to you now is the results of that. Uh, we actually uh, had a lot of uh, sites um, and surgeons implement this, and here's what you see. So uh, we tracked this in just over 3,000 patients, and uh, 343 received the questionnaire right after discharge. Um, 761 were actually seen in clinic for a, a wellness visit or staple removal. <clears throat> 138 patients had both done, and then uh, 1,765 uh, did not have these interventions, yet it was tracked prospectively uh, that they didn't have these for a total of just over 3,000 patients. Um, and here are the results. Um, in an unadjusted fashion, this is the 30-day readmission rate. Um, you look at the uh, questionnaire only, about 3%. They got, if they had the clinic visit only, again, right after discharge, but before the 30-day post-op visit, 3%, a little bit higher for the questionnaire and clinic, and then uh, uh, the overall rate was 5%, and this was significant. Now, we did a, a, an adjusted analysis where we De developed a risk-adjusted model predicting 30-day post-op readmissions and including all the factors that really came up as significant that would impact 30-day readmission rates. Most of these were wound issues, but I think this is something that, that's really exciting, and that is um, if you administer the questionnaire, um, you had an odds ratio for that readmission of 0.42 which means it was protective of a uh, readmission, or if you had that clinic visit, um, you had an odds ratio of 0.48. So basically, what this means is that if you administer the questionnaire or you had a clinic visit, um, you reduced readmissions in a risk-adjusted way, or kind of putting it another way, um, if you gave someone that, re re that reduction in readmissions questionnaire, we were able to demonstrate a 58% reduction in 30-day readmissions, or if you just simply saw a patient um, after their um, discharge in clinic prior to the 30-day follow-up, you're able to reduce readmissions by 52%. And if you calculate this out within the AHSQC, uh, we avoided 29 readmissions, which very conservatively translates to about $337,000 from the QC. So I just want to kind of emphasize this. This is really, well, I think is a, is a really good uh, example of why we are a collaborative. And I do want to take this opportunity also to invite a little bit of discussion on uh, 
those who uh, may have implemented this, those who are potentially thinking about it, um, and see if you guys have any questions about this because um, uh, I think just about every hospital is interested in uh, showing some return on investment in these type of things. Every hospital is pretty much in, in, uh, interested in reducing readmissions. So what I'll do is um, I'll go ahead and um, open this up for some discussion. Um, and uh, those of you who are on the phone, um, <clears throat> I'll go ahead and unmute you, but I might have to mute you back and get a lot of feedback. Hey, Ben, can you hear me? Yeah, Mike. Hey, this is Mike. So let me uh, maybe start some of the discussion because because I think uh, you know from my obviously this data is really exciting, and a lot of this gets down to kind of nitty gritty stuff of actually for those folks in private practice, how are they going to actually implement this? From those people in kind of community practice or or at an academic center, I think um, you know adding something as simple as a phone call, this question seems so easy, but then it gets really difficult. Of how do you track the patients? Who do you call? How do you determine this? So I, I don't know uh, some of the folks on the call who have done this. Maybe share what you've done. I can tell you what we've done, um, and we just did this at the main hospital so far at, at, uh, at the clinic. And eventually, via your smartphone or webcam for when uh, we will eventually spread it out. But what we basically did is all of our nurses who were clinic nurses. Um, were given the epic access where they could track discharge dates and they did it five to seven days after discharge and tried to avoid calling on Fridays or obviously the weekend so that if something came up they could come up earlier so we really tried to make the calls Tuesdays, Wednesdays and Thursdays and if you really do it on a rolling basis it's only really a couple people at a time that you're calling um, and then they would just go through these questions and it would prompt uh, the early return. But to, for us, it was our office-based nurse who was doing it. Um, anybody else uh, kind of implement this in their practice any different ways? Or Hey, Mike, it's Jake. Hey, Jake, go yeah. ahead. So, uh, so it sounds like we, Mike and I do pretty much the same thing. So my office-based nurse who has uh, access to my schedule, Outlook, and on Epic, uh, just once a week goes through and calls all the people who had insensitive dental hernia repairs from the last week and documents that in Epic. And then usually when we see them back in public, I can just click back through the chart and see if they've been administered the questionnaire or not. So it was a it was a very easy thing to implement. Yeah, it looks like uh, um, Jamie Clancy had an input on. Um, instant messaging basically he would have uh, his nurse call uh, the next day and uh, um, implement it that way and let's see I'm going to turn down I'm going to kind of uh, mute the uh, callers again I apologize you're just getting too much interference here <clears throat> There we go. Yeah, Ben, maybe if we have folks, uh, maybe instant message, and we can kind of talk and share, maybe just that one person uh, can add that. Um, yeah, 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 I apologize to the callers. We're just uh, going to have to mute most of you uh, if you're not on the web, if you're not doing the web audio. Um, is it? And, but I'll just add, how we did it uh, over at our hospital is um, I had – a couple people involved. I made some of the calls. Um, some of my front office dad made some of the calls, and uh, our nurses did. And what we found is that uh, people liked getting that the, the call as far as uh, um, that particular contact. And so um, it, it worked well. But it was, you know, it certainly was uh, a culture change over here where we're not used to having a lot of um, contact with our patients between discharge and the 30-day follow-up. Uh, it looks like William Hope has an instant message that I've had trouble implementing this, but I've done a little. Um, and so, yeah, he, you know, kind of think this is a way to potentially talk about how to make this happen. Um, but I have to, I would add again, we analyze this in a lot of different ways, and uh, it was pretty clear that 
these two separate things um, really led to a, a significant reduction in readmissions. It's interesting. If you look and you see what happened to the patients who, um, um, to, who got the questionnaire and also were seen in clinic prior to the 30-day visit, those folks had a high chance of re a kind of higher chance of readmission, higher wound events, and it makes sense because those are the folks who there's something going on. You see them in clinic, they have an issue, they may get admitted, whatnot. So it all kind of internally makes uh, made a lot of sense. Hey, uh, Ben, um, you know the the other thing I would add about this is interesting. I'm just going to kind of respond to what uh, Jamie Clancy said. Because I think this is actually kind of a huge opportunity um, to think about the way you deal with your clinic time and uh, following up patients. In that, um, so I'll just tell you myself, uh, and I've actually talked to Alfie a little about this. I don't know if he's on the call too, but is that uh, if you actually use some particular sutures and maybe a non contaminated situation, I typically don't see those patients back until after about three weeks because uh, by then they've kind of got over a lot of the discomfort and everything. So I have a big stretch of not seeing folks, especially if they live kind of far away. So you avoid that early post-op visit of them coming back in, using office resources to maybe take out staples or whatnot, and another trip and sitting in the waiting area and things like that. Uh, but by doing this thing, one of the ways I've kind of pitched it to my nurses uh, you're saving that visit and that time by a quick phone call, and then you're still kind of pinging the person just to make sure that nothing is horrible or wrong. So I don't know what other folks do as far as, um, you know, if you see folks back in a week or so. Most of us are doing that just to make sure the wound's okay. And if you can do this with this kind of, you know, nearly validated questionnaire, uh, I think um, it, 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 it certainly uh, – could make things a little bit more streamlined as well. Now, so Sharon Grunfest, who's one of my partners, is on here as well. So I'm gonna, I want to speak up for Sharon because uh, we all kind of have a clinic in the same way. We don't actually share the same nurse, but but I think for everybody out there, kind of getting buy-in uh, from your nurses and everything is actually it's it's a hard thing to do, and I, I will come clean. My nurse was resistant to this at first, and we kind of had to go through a whole process. But I think when you come back and realize, you know, over three hundred thousand dollars savings, um, it is a uh, it's very important. So I think it's worth. So let's, Jonathan, Eunice, you're, you're, you you want to? Uh, are you maybe hit your question? Yeah, my my question is is that in in my practice, um, that that I'm using pretty much staples for the major abdominal wall cases, and they I usually have to see them back within ten to fourteen days, and that usually meets the criteria. And um, I'm just wondering, so, so would you prefer that we're using subcuticular sutures? And, and I understand what you're saying, like I'd rather delay seeing them so we don't have to have that big conversation. But I feel like I have to see almost everybody because of a drain or staples or something that we're seeing these people, um, but, but we're not really using the form because we're seeing them for those reasons. What do you think about that or what would you say? So, so first of all, we're actually, just to let you know, uh, Ajita Prabhu and Eric Pali, we're working on it now. Hopefully by the end of the, the month we'll have it in its final form. We're actually going to start tracking how you close the skin and see if that may or may not affect outcomes with some different kind of iterations of that. So I, at this moment, there's no recommendation about uh, clinically one is better than the other by any means. Uh, for me, it's more of just a convenience thing. Uh, and I don't want to waste time and, you know, these are big incisions. I don't want to waste time taking all the staples, but, but we're going to track all that. So, so everybody keep doing what you do and we'll be able to see whether or not that has any, you know, clinically meaningful things. And, um, you know, as far as how many days to see them back, I mean, I, we also don't kind of have clear guidelines for that yet, but I think this is kind of one of those opportunities when you really kind of break it down and think about maybe why we're seeing folks, a lot of us are seeing them, with the exception of drains, we're seeing them just to kind of check that wound, make ourselves feel better, make sure we don't miss something big. And this might be that opportunity to streamline that. Yeah, no, this is a great discussion. Uh, I'm just going to run through some of the uh, instant messaging uh, uh, messages here. Uh, there's one question from our uh, Dayball colleagues, Bar Dayball colleagues. Um, are 30 day readmits still associated with prior smoking? As previously discussed, um, yes, a distant history of smoking classified as one year or greater um, was associated with uh, readmits. Um, 
and that just goes back to those models where we showed that it really is the majority of the issues had to do with wounds, and that's certainly a risk factor. Um, and Chris Schneider brought up uh, Bruce Ramshaw's uh, data presented at Sages uh, showing that the increasing number of interactions you have with patients probably benefits outcomes. Um, it's interesting. Uh, I think certainly that's a two-way street in terms of resources used, but I think we're seeing some of the same things here that if you look at the big ticket I I items that we're trying to avoid in terms of readmissions and even wound morbidity, certainly there is some truth to uh, having some close interactions with patients. Um, the other thing that we haven't really talked much about, but I think uh, some folks are doing on an increasing basis is um, having some type of electronic follow-up um, with patients, having them you know, um, send pictures of wounds, that sort of thing. But I think uh, overall, uh, this is this is really encouraging. I think we're heading in the right direction. And I would just, I would, uh, you know, I would tag on to that. I think um, the kind of concept of getting as much in contact as possible is a great one. But I think it's also important for us to realize. I know there's a lot of folks, particularly the collaborative, as well, whose hospitals are now trying to limit them to only seeing new patients in clinic. And not really even want just wanting nurse practitioner visits for all the follow up, and so I think kind of using some of these different tools, uh, we don't do that, but I know that some folks do, and I think that um, uh, you know just having a efficient way to kind of ping somebody would be a way that I would you know recommend bringing this into your practice, into your nurses, your nurse practitioners, and I do think Ben, I mean, I, maybe just talk real quick, the way the questionnaire is designed. For the record, I don't even think it needs to be somebody with clinical background. It could even be a secretary because uh, they're really, if you answer yes to questions, it should prompt uh, a clinic visit. So the way it's set up, it doesn't really require somebody with a lot of clinical acumen to help you out. Yeah, yeah, that's correct. It's kind of a standalone thing. And, uh, yeah, if there's a yes, uh, that's how we implement it. Uh, if there's a yes answer, it goes to uh, uh, either a nurse practitioner or myself. Um, uh, Sharon uh, Tofig actually brought up a really good point, and she mentioned that uh, you know her nurse always calls a patient one to two days post-op, and then she sees them at two weeks. Um, this is important because you know there's been a lot of work into trying to figure out what's the best time frame between discharge and about a month before a potential readmission. It's really within that first week that it's it's critical. Mike, you mentioned that uh, you wait five to seven days from discharge. Why do you do that? Why don't you call them earlier? Me? Yeah, your, your folks, when you implemented this. Uh, I just, I, honestly, I thought that was what that questionnaire told us to do. Did it say within five to seven days? I, I can't remember. Yeah, it's within a know. week. Yeah, it's within okay. a week. Um, so I think, some, we, I think yeah. We, yeah, we did that primarily because I operate on Wednesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays. Uh, I'm sorry, Tuesday, Wednesdays, and Fridays. And it just, we didn't want things to be over the weekend. So we kind of made it a range where nurses weren't having to call people over the weekend or um, or on a Friday where it gets tricky to see somebody in clinic and make an intervention. Right. Um, so, yeah, this is great. And so, I, again, I think um, for those of you who are thinking about implementing this or haven't done it, um, it's something that's relatively easily done. The, the questionnaire itself uh, someone had mentioned this as kind of you've been using this as a triage tool. I think Sharon mentioned that actually. Um, and I think that would be kind of the ideal way to implement this is, uh, you know, you can kind of decide if uh, someone has an issue based on this uh, as opposed to routinely bringing them in. Uh, there are a lot of ways to implement it. But uh, again, I think this again highlights this isn't just a registry. We're working to try to improve things. And we did it. We actually, believe it or not, we moved a needle. We reduced readmissions after ventral hernia repair. This is a big deal, and uh, I think everyone uh, should be proud of this because I think we really, really uh, show that we can we can do something here. And hey, Ben, let me just tack on one last thing to that comment too. I think that, um, and this is really, really where I think. So we moved the needle, but now can we move a big group? Because when you look at the participation in the readmission reduction. You know, it's about 10, 20 percent of the entire collaborative. So I think now the next phase of this, and it's a difficult thing to do, is that we all kind of buy into this data and we implement it in our practice as a big group. So I think this is kind of the ability for us to kind of share via email these webinars, 
all of our tricks, and then everybody do what is the hardest thing in the world is to go back tomorrow and change the way your, you know, practice group actually does things. Uh, and that will move that needle even further because we've already collected and shown data, which is huge. <clears throat> but now we, before we can change the world's practice, we got to change the people on this call. So I think that this is really the opportunity to kind of write this down. We have it uh, available on the web to get and really kind of come up with ways and maybe reach out to Ben or myself if you're having trouble individually or Shelby, and we'll kind of maybe get my nurse to talk to you. Uh, Sharon, I'll, I'll get Mike uh, to talk to Rachel, and we'll make it happen. <laughs> yeah, this is great. Um, and just to kind of uh, rehash some of the things we talked about at AHS, um, we talked uh, a lot about um, the potential ways to reduce wound events and uh, length of stay, and these are actionable items that I think we just want to continue on based on our data. Um, retromuscular drain use is protective against uh, surgical site occurrences. Um, bowel prep, we found, was associated with increased wound events in class one repairs. Really no effect on class two, class three. Therefore, um, a lot of us have abandoned bowel preps for this reason. And uh, surprisingly, pre hospital chlorhexidine scrub associated with increased wound events uh, in class one uh, ventral hernia repairs. Um, a lot of our institutions have abandoned this as well. And we'll, again, we'll continue to track this. Um, and we spoke about uh, the advantage in terms of length of stay with robotic retromuscular approaches. So I think if you kind of take this uh, as a whole, these are things that you and I and everyone on this call can uh, implement pretty easily over the next uh, couple of days or weeks in our practices. And that's it's really important for the mission of the HSQC. Hey, Ben, Ben, let me just uh, uh, tag on one last thing. Um, we're actually, Dave Krapata is analyzing all the bowel prep data right now and trying to get it ready for a uh, manuscript. And one of the things that was brought up at the QC meeting during AHS in D.C. was really understanding what everybody's interpretation of a mechanical bowel prep. So we're trying to get a little bit more information. So hopefully within the next couple weeks, you will be getting an email from us uh, for all those of you who uh, have used a bowel prep, uh, you'll be getting an email from us, and we're going to try and understand what exactly uses a bowel prep, whether it's just a couple Ducalax or mag citrate or whatever. So it's kind of a uh, it's an IRB approved questionnaire. I think it's just three or four questions, but when you get that, if you could respond back, because that's how we're going to really kind of narrow it down. Um, just so we you know as we understand what is. Uh, the bowel press that we use because the data certainly suggests that they increase uh, wound problems, particularly in clean wounds. So um, uh, does anybody feel strongly about any of these kind of uh, uh, key wound reduction things that maybe uh, if we want to go back and look at with a little bit more detail, feel free to chime in as we're kind of really trying to get deep into all this data. Yeah, there's a Mike, there's a couple of uh, instant messaging uh, messages on this. Um, Basically, wanting to Sharon and Jamie wanted to look at in a little bit more detail about, uh, you know, immediate pre immediate use of chlorhexidine wipes beforehand, right before operation, um, and uh, it may just like we talked about with the bowel prep, it may be worth diving into that a little bit more. No, I think that's a great idea. Um, and uh, so Jonathan Eunice mentioned about uh, using bowel prep to uh, reduce intradermal pressure. Certainly something that uh, can be worth considering, too. So, again, I think these are discussions we all need to have. Um, but, yeah, no, great thoughts. Perfect. Great. So let's uh, move on here um, and just kind of summarize what we've done. And, again, just reiterate, this is all in the past year. We've established a trainee research grant, established ourselves as a CMS uh, qualified clinical data registry, um, identified actionable ways to reduce wound events and length of stay, and we really moved the needle in uh, reducing uh, early readmissions. Um, there's a question on instant messaging. Can we use some of the slides in the webinar to educate our partners? Absolutely. Um, in fact, yeah, this will be available, um, and I will also uh, make available a slide deck um, that shows this. Yeah, that's a, it's a great idea. So. We're going to transition to really kind of what we need um, from you as our collaborative um, on, the, you know, making this uh, move further. Um, and some of the details are worth kind of talking about a bit here as far as data collection. Everyone has done a really phenomenal job about 
getting data entered and uh, working with our data assurance process to make sure that data is accurate. And I just wanted to highlight a couple of extra things um, that we need to kind of shore up to keep moving forward. Um, our 30-day follow-up is really, really remarkable um, overall for the uh, just short of 10,000 patients, and I think it's about 7,800 who have operations. We have 88% 30-day follow-up, uh, and that's, that's really, really great. Our goal is 95%. I want to mention some leaders out there um, who have a, have a very high volume practice and have 100% 30-day follow-up. Anthony Falvo, mention everybody's name. Rick Gemma, Jake Greenberg, um, Sharon, who's uh, several folks are on this webinar, uh, Javier Herrera, Jeffrey Janis, and uh, Kent Kircher. So congratulations to that group. Um, and again, keep it up. And a lot of folks uh, have between 90 and 100%, but we all want to strive for a goal of 95%. So the other important thing is um, one real cornerstone of, of our follow-up um, is our patient reported outcomes. And um, this is really comprised of our, pay, of, of our questionnaires that are administered baseline and post-op. Um, we would ask the collaborative, one of the most important things to complete is that baseline pre-op questionnaire. Um, if there's one questionnaire you want to pick to try to have complete, it's this one, because if, if we don't do this, we kind of lose the opportunity to uh, compare post-op uh, time points and improvements with this uh, pre-op one. This is what it looks like. Um, again, this is available on the resources section of the uh, website. Um, it can be accomplished by either email. If you enter the patient's email um, in the demographic section, it automatically gets pushed out to them. Um, I administer a lot of these in clinic uh, when I schedule someone for the operate for an operation. We actually print these out and uh, put a little stamp on it with all the patient information and put them in the medical record. But they can also administer it by phone. Again, the, the pre-op one is the most important one. Um, I'm just kind of curious, uh, for those on the call who do this, uh, how have you been administering this? Uh, what kind of challenges have you had? That kind of stuff. Let's briefly discuss that. Uh, ben, this is Mike. I'll, I'll chime into this because this, and, and, and full disclosure, has been the absolute hardest thing uh, for me to do because uh, it, 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 it clinic gets out of control, and um, you know it's just hard to kind of work through all this. Uh, so what we just started doing now uh, is that uh, my nurse now uh, has uh, his own access to the AHSQC and everybody comes back for a pre-op teaching session with him where I'm not involved. And uh, it's at that session now where he's going through all the operative stuff that he hands the information for patient sheet, gives them just a 30 second, this is why we're tracking your data, this is why I think it's important, this is how we keep track of you long term. And then when he's uh, done, he, he'll he log them on so that they can uh, answer these questions. Uh, and do it right there and that um, we're just starting it but I think for, for my practice you know it took me it was probably 30 percent email response rate up to hopefully uh, so much higher but I, I really struggle with it in clinic and for me the resources of kind of people filling it out by paper and then who was going to put it in was kind of too difficult for me to overcome but this has been the last thing I really just added So we have a, a instant message uh, regarding this. Um, uh, Gordon Hafner mentioned, uh, I do it when I see the patient take some five minutes. Um, the problem I have is entering demographics. I hear rumors about automating it through Epic. Um, yeah, so um, we are. We actually do have a, a group, a task force looking at Epic integration. Um, it's a little bit of ways off, but uh, that's one of our priorities over the next uh, year, in fact. Um, you know, it's interesting. What I've found in my practice is that um, patients like doing this when they're waiting for me, and uh, uh, but it, it's been it's been hard. Um, I got to say we had to really kind of change our our processes. So what everyone pretty much everyone who has a hernia gets this, even if it's an inguinal hernia, because it was so hard to just differentiate between ventral versus inguinal. So we pretty much give this to everybody, which may provide us some information. For those of you who aren't doing it right now, um, is this something that you see as feasible, or what are the big barriers to getting this done, that type of stuff. Uh, 
This is like AA, guys. This is you're all like anonymous. <laughs> You don't have to actually say your name. I've come clean and said, I don't do this this much either. So this is our moment. I think actually talking about the barriers are probably more important than talking about the solutions uh, because because this is awkward and kind of clunky uh, to do this. So um, I think, you know, uh, this is a key opportunity to use it at a non-clinic visit. Hey, uh, I'm just going to answer, uh, Gordon Hafner, your question about demographics. Um, just, just real quick to make this clear, when you fill out the first page on the QC with the names and and emails and all that and, and the address and phone numbers now, that prompts the email baseline questionnaire. Um, and for the record, my secretary does that when she books the case. She has another login and she is on the phone with the patient and just fills that out so that when I come to the OR, I I have the patient list. I pull it up with the search feature, and then uh, I just go and do um, you know the patient history and the operative details. So uh, I found that has been very efficient. And it's pretty easy for her to do because she's just sitting right in front of the computer and it avoids what is the hassle of the address and the phone number and stuff like that. I found that very helpful. Um, and then the automatic thing. I think Ben, you mentioned it, but hopefully soon. Yeah, and. Uh... As I we're just transitioning to Epic, and uh, certainly there's a patient portal available. Our goal is to actually have that form, have this form replicated um, on the Epic uh, interface itself. Um, someone asked a question, which I, this is actually a really good point um, about um, adding a patient name block to this, uh, where patients can write in their name. Yeah, that's actually a really good point. And uh, what we'll do is we can modify it a little bit so. There's there's a name for that, um, and we'll do that. Great. Let's uh, move on here. Um, so again, where to find these questionnaires and also the information for patients? Um, you just log on, uh, click on resources. There's this little icon that looks like a book. Uh, that's the resources icon, and then uh, it'll show you all the documents available. Just a reminder: all patients should be getting the patient information for patients sheet. By the way, um, we just uh, went live with our Spanish translations, so um, these are just for the printable forms. That includes the patient information sheet, the information for patients, um, the uh, baseline 30-day uh, questionnaire, and also the long-term questionnaire. And just so um, folks, it's, so it's clear, um, the baseline questionnaire, the pre-op one, is the same one as a 30-day, and then everything after that occurs with that long-term follow-up questionnaire. So again, the Spanish versions are available now. Um, this was uh, at, at the request of a lot of our, uh, our participants, especially on the West Coast and in the Texas region. So um, we're excited to offer that now. So to reiterate, the baseline questionnaire, if you had to pick one of them, that's the most important one to administer. Um, ideally, every time the patient comes in, they should be administered the 30-day uh, or the long-term follow-up questionnaire. Again, logistically, there's no question this is a challenge. Um, it's, we, we've come this far with uh, doing a whole lot of good things. Uh, this is really kind of the next step for us because this provides such critical information on uh, our patients that I think really sets us apart from just uh, being a data gathering exercise. Um, and um, if you enter an email way back at the demographics, a lot of this happens automatically. Um, I should also let you know that um, the AHSQC itself is going to be calling and emailing patients um, for a lot of the long-term follow-up. It's, it's very difficult for the QC, nearly impossible, of course, to do that preoperatively, uh, but certainly the uh, AHSQC can do that um, for a long-term follow-up. Does anyone have any questions about hey that in terms – yeah, go ahead, Mike. Hey, Ben, real quick, um, I just want to point out one thing from the instant message here uh, before we – it's kind of in relation with you, is what uh, Jamie Clancy brought up about not entering the data until uh, after the surgery. So uh, one of the goals is to get that patient demographics filled out before the day of surgery so that it prompts the patient reported outcomes. Um so when you think about kind of how you implement this and where you fill it out, at least the patient, at least the patient demographics, if that can be done earlier, um, that would be ideal. And for Sharon asked, who enters the data when the patients get an email? 
uh, oh, you put this in already. When they email, um, they fill it out, and you get it directly uh, populates back to the QC if they do it via their email. Yeah, yeah. Let me let me talk about that a little bit since we're getting into such detail here. So, what happens is, um, as soon as you enter an email and click submit on the demographics uh, page, either you or one of your staff, um, in about a day or two, um, a, a link goes out to the email recipient, your patient. And that's a secure link that then is also linked to the patient entry that you put in. And so it literally takes them to the page where you would enter the information and the patient does it themselves. And it's all – it's pretty patient-friendly overall. And so that's that's what happens. Um, should also know that um, only about – we found at Vanderbilt that – Probably only about 54% of patients will have a, an email or be willing to email. So that's why we've implemented a lot of these uh, paper workarounds, which are admittedly a little clunky. But again, we want to try to get the information as, uh, as best we can. You can use it. Um, the other uh, – oh, go ahead. Ed, real quick, too, just – I don't know if you're going to go on this more, but just, just so everybody kind of um, gets that, just so we don't kind of gloss over that they – start to be doing long-term follow-up at the HSQC and contacting people. Uh, are you about to talk about this right now? Yeah, you go ahead, go ahead. Okay. Um, contacting people via a telephone call. I just want to let everybody know, in case kind of your get calls about this or whatnot, we have a very standard uh, uh, script that will be read off. We're not going to address any clinical issues. It will just be call your doctor and we're just going through kind of the questions that are there. Uh, so there will be no, it will just be an administrative call. Uh, but just in case your office people call, we'll be calling on behalf of the AHSQC. We have it pretty clear what we are, but we will be contacting folks to, to administer some of these surveys uh, when we're doing that. Great. Um. So one other thing um, that we're going to try to do, um, so many of you have noticed that um, starting this January in 2016, uh, we've asked you to enter some more detail uh, as far as the patient demographics are concerned, um, phone numbers, um, address, physical addresses, that sort of thing. That's specifically geared for long-term follow-up. Um, if you have the ability to do this, uh, what we did was um, – all those fields are left open on every patient, even patients prior to 2016. And so um, we already started this here at our hospital where um, I'm having some of my front office staff uh, just backfill that information. Um, if, if we just get folks starting to do that, um, it re would be really helpful in terms of long-term follow-up. It just saves us a step when the AHSQC um, is going to call or contact a patient if we don't have that information already in there, we're going to have to contact the surgeon's office and get it. I mean, that that's okay. We can do that. But um, hopefully we can get at least a, a, a proportion of those uh, patients who are entered in between 2013 and 2015 to just uh, have someone look up these folks and enter it in directly. Um, if you have the ability to do that, that would be great. Um, I just wanted to put that out there. Mike, any comments about that? No, I, no, no comments other than, you know, always these things are a hassle to get the, you know, uh, administrative support to do it. But but I think that, um, you know, it just always is kind of more of a rah-rah thing. I mean, I think it's just so key to realize that, you know, we have almost 10,000 patients. We have, not, you know, 90% 30-day follow-up. We have accomplished what every other kind of quality improvements that registry has done up until now, and this is kind of our opportunity to get, which we all know is kind of rail in, in, in hernia surgery, which is long-term data, where so many of the questions that, that, that we all want answered lie. So I think it's, it's a little bit of a hassle, but I, I would recommend that at least what I'm going to do is start with my earliest patients and work back, because those are really the key. I mean, we can start getting two- to three-year follow-up now, which will really take this as we think about value-based purchases, we think about all the things we want to change, it puts us in a field where nobody else can even come close when we start providing that level of value. So it's definitely a hassle, but but so key. Yeah, this, this is it, folks, because 30-day outcomes are good. Um, 
everyone on this call knows that that's not where things stop in hernia surgery. Um, so do what you can to try and backfill that information. It would be really, really helpful as the AHSQC does their long-term follow-up. Um, I've had a couple of emails with folks over the past couple of months on what happens when someone dies or has a recurrence. Um, so we're talking about that a little bit here. Um, basically, you, you complete the form that uh, um, you need to complete clinically, either in 30-day follow-up or the additional surgeon follow-up. Um, technically speaking, if someone dies or has a recurrence, and what I mean by a recurrence is, of course, they were uh, you entered in their information at the time of operation, say, a year ago into the QC, and then now they come back and see you and they have a recurrence. What do you do? Um, technically speaking, um, the follow-up ends for those folks. Um, you don't, you know, even if you reoperate on them, what you don't do is uh, put in another entry for the patient um, because really kind of we're stopping there for now. And what you do is um, you can pull up the patient list, click on the patient, and you see it here. Sorry, it's a little fuzzy, but you can, there's a status um, link over there on the top right with a uh, number one on it. You click on that, and it brings up a patient status, and you can either select that the patient is deceased or their follow up ended due to a recurrence. Um, and uh, uh, that really is helpful. Really, uh, it, it helps us avoid calling a patient who may have died and has a family member hanging here their email or their phone. It avoids those kind of things. So really, the, the capturing the debts are really important, uh, but certainly the uh, recurrences as well and knowing that the follow-up stops. Thoughts on that, anybody? Um, I just want to chime in on this. I think that uh, this is really key just to stress that as we start to call people long term, um, being accurate on uh, particularly the death uh, really onus is on you a little bit to just make sure that that is changed because it obviously it's a difficult situation for us and, and honestly for you as well and the patient's family. When we get a call asking, you know, quality of life questions about somebody who died during their hospital stay for their hernia repair. So um, I just think that's really key. Uh, and so just kind of put that in the front of your mind just to uh, do that. Yeah. And so what uh, William Hope just mentioned that uh, he had a patient who died and the wife kept getting emails and, and got upset. Um, that's exactly what we're trying to avoid. Um, what you should also know is that. Um, in the follow-up forms, if some of you guys remember, guys and gals remember that there's a, a toggle for death as a as an outcome measure. We use that also to feed into this. Uh, there's a couple of different ways to indicate a patient's died. All that information is taken and linked to the email follow-up to avoid that. But it all goes back into this uh, status uh, selection here. Um, let's see. Uh, there's a instant message from Jamie Clancy saying that we need to follow recurrence and start a new data entry. Yeah, we're, we're working on that and um, that most notably to kind of get an idea on why these things recurred, especially if they uh, have, if you reoperate on them, which a lot of us do. Um, we're working on a mechanism to do that. It becomes kind of really difficult to analyze when you have the same patient in there a couple of times. Um, but that's okay. We're going to try to figure out a way to capture that because certainly that's well within our mission is to figure out what happens to these folks, why they recurred, that type of thing. What I should add, though, is um, we are capturing, of course, uh, folks who are having recurrent hernias. It's probably most of our practices up front, and uh, that provides us some information on potential mechanisms of recurrence, but we're working on that. It's a good comment. Um, a brief word on exporting, downloading your data. Um, again, everyone has access to their own data. Um, there's an ex advanced export function. If you pull up the patient list on the right side there, you'll see a little icon for a spreadsheet. You can click that and you can download your own information. Um, do note that um, you can download protected health information using this. Uh, only the folks you have access to. So just be sure to save that in a HIPAA compliant fashion. And uh, Mike, uh, you're going to say a couple words about sending your data to others. Yeah, so listen, I, I think uh, I know a, a lot of you, or hopefully all of you, including our foundation partners on the call and everything, 
got an email sent out, uh, I believe, at the end of last week or, or early this week, um, going over exactly what all the issues are with kind of the data and exactly what you own, what you're allowed to share and everything. And so um, certainly if there's any specific questions you have related to that email, feel free to instant message and, and we'll try and address those. But just to kind of give you a, a general summary, um, the specific incident that kind of occurred was around surgical momentum and a little bit of confusion about what exactly you're allowed to do. And obviously, Surgical Momentum is a quality improvement organization as well. And, and I mean, up front and for the record, an organization that I hope at one day we'll be able to collaborate with and, and do some pretty great things because I think we're complementary uh, to each other in this. But uh, they're doing an active um, uh, QI piece right now for a company. Uh, and who happens to not be one of our foundation partners. And then there was a question about whether or not uh, AHSQC surgeon could just download to an Excel sheet and forward all the AHSQC information to Surgical Momentum and, and what exactly would be the ownership process of that. And we really went back and kind of reviewed everything carefully. And in our letter, and I would encourage you to read it, uh, we really want to specify, just so everybody kind of understands what they're doing, uh, and, and what's allowed and what's not allowed. And I think the overwhelming reason for that is really that uh, we're committed to making this free uh, for surgeons. Um, and it's a very expensive thing. It's, it's, it's roughly about $2,000 to $2,500 per surgeon per year to kind of keep you involved in this. So um, we just want to make sure that that is sustainable. Uh, and that, um, you know, if we're going to share that data, there's some kind of contractual arrangement between us. And, and I think there'll be many more of these third party uh, data warehouses that, that our data will be extremely interested in. And so if anybody contacts you in that way, uh, number one, I would just encourage you to send them to Ben or myself. Or, or if you have questions beyond that uh, email, feel free to uh, contact Ben or myself. We definitely want to keep this. Uh, very available so that you guys can use it for QI, research purposes, publications, uh, and all those types of things. And so um, managing that freedom of the data and, and keeping it uh, uh, where we can provide this as a free service for you guys, I think is, is uh, uh, can cause issues and a bit of a dilemma. But, but I mean, this is up for discussion. Uh, certainly, if any of our foundation partners have any thoughts on this, I know we... Uh, uh, sends a letter out to you guys as well just to let you know what's going on. I, I think, um, you know, it's a sensitive topic, so we just want to make sure that we kind of handle it up front, fully transparent in, in, in what we're doing. So uh, any comments about that, uh, let me know. Great. Uh, thanks, Mike. Um, it's interesting. Uh, Sharon uh, Grunfest, Mike, one of your partners, actually had a, a comment. I want to read that. Uh, it goes back to our discussion about recurrences. Uh, she mentioned it might be useful to keep doing follow-up of recurrences, particularly with biologics, since most of these patients will have additional operations. Um, I think that's a really uh, insightful comment because um, if you look at how a lot of the folks in the collaborative are using biologics, um, I think it's more as a as a staged approach, um, you know, for these real disaster situations that we know they're going to recur and they're going to come back later on, use it as a bridge. Um, I still capture all those. I, I enter those in, and I think we should enter those in. And certainly when we analyze that, obviously we will know that um, these were done in very difficult situations. And in fact, when we look at our biologic use, we're seeing some of that uh, on the analytics side where you know it's clear that biologics are being used for more difficult situations to really kind of get out of a tough situation. That's an important thing to know. Um, let me just answer... Uh uh, Gordon actually uh, brought up a thing about are we going to do kind of a risk stratification. We're actually working on that right now. Uh, we're hopefully going to have an AHSQC um, decision support tool out there, which, which, you know, when you kind of consider there's a lot of different kind of staging systems, risk stratifications, but really be the first one done from multiple different sur surgeons with multiple different expertise and everything, which I think will be extremely powerful. So, we are working on that now. I can't give you an exact deliverable yet, but but it should be coming. Yeah, um, word on that. Um, one of the things we wanted to focus on was um, 
really developing a uh, risk calculator that was based off of a fair representation of um, a wide swath of patients. I think uh, the CEDAR app is a great one, um, but again, you got to be careful about where that information is going, is coming from. And the other kind of piece to that is, I think one thing we're trying to do in the collaborative is update all the models that go into those kind of risk calculators. So we're kind of working on the logistics of that right now, where you we are able to uh, have a decision support tool that's based on a pretty good representative population of patients, but also that gets updated as we keep entering patients. And we're working on that, absolutely. So just to kind of summarize the process for obtaining AHSQC data, um, we talked briefly about how you can download your own data. Um, as a member of the collaborative, as a surgeon, um, you have access to the entire AHSQC-wide data. Um, just email Shelby, and um, you do, we do have some minimums associated with those. You have to have a minimum of 25 cases and 30-day follow-up and be a member in good standing. We'll have you complete a, uh, a request form and a uh, data use agreement. This then goes to our data use and publications committee, which will um, fed out the request. And Vanderbilt, the data coordinating center, um, does the IRB for you and will also do the analysis. Just to kind of wrap up now with uh, where we are going with all this, um, a brief slide here. We're uh, actively working on the AHSQC inguinal module. Um, we met in Chicago last Wednesday to really kind of hash out um, the details of this. Uh, it's a combined effort between AHSQC and SAGES. Um, and we were very, very productive. We kind of worked out about 95% of the details we need to. Um, so just kind of keep this in mind um, that we will open this up really for any abdominal wall um, uh, hernia. And that's a really exciting thing. And we're hoping to have this online uh, in the next uh, few months here. Um, we spoke about EMR integration. Um, we've got a task force working on this as well. We mentioned this in the context of patient reported outcomes. But certainly the goal is to try to avoid double data entry for a lot of sites that use Epic and some other uh, popular vendors. And uh, that's on our radar. Uh, we are working on that actively. Um, Jake Greenberg, um, who apparently doesn't have any recurrences, so doesn't have to worry about that, um, uh, has uh, spearheaded our surgical coaching effort. And um, he has. we've already started this and uh, had a, a really productive call about a week ago um, really getting that off the ground. We're excited to see what that uh, shows us. We're going to have an update on that um, at the ACS this fall. We mentioned about long-term follow-up, um, and I just want to emphasize again what Mike said. Um, this is really what's going to set us apart. Um, we're already kind of working out the logistics of how do we really engage patients for long-term follow-up. We're kind of steering the collaborative in that direction. We've done a great job getting the 30-day follow-up, great job getting uh, everything up and going but we've got to push forward and really obtain that long-term follow-up. I should also add that um, our foundation partners um, are also working uh, diligently in concert with us uh, on the executive council of the AHSQC to use the data for uh, FDA regulatory submissions. We have uh, three of our foundation partners who are uh, actively pursuing that right now, and that's another example of collaboration that occurs between the QC, the, our foundation partners, and the FDA. And I also want to kind of thank our, our current foundation partners for this year, um, LifeCell, Bard Dayval, Intuitive, and um, Covidian Medtronic. Um, again, we're excited to uh, continue these partnerships, and uh, this would not be possible without you. And I uh, just wanted to mention them as well. Mike, uh, any thoughts? Um, yeah, you know, I, I think um, these are always exciting when we kind of get to put all this together and see the engagement of everybody, and it certainly gets – all of us, and certainly Ben and I, are kind of really excited. I think a couple things, um, kind of logistical things, just to kind of keep you guys abreast of kind of some of the decisions that we make uh, behind the scenes as well. Um, one of the things we're really committed to doing, and that I think we get a lot of uh, pushback about, is that this is surgeon-entered data, um, and uh, you know what, what, what does all that mean? So um we there's two kind of key things that, that we're going to kind of really start ramping up so be prepared for this uh because we'll be reaching out to you and some folks have already kind of uh, gone through this process but we will have a much more robust data assurance uh plan that you will be contacted uh, it's, it's fairly automated uh and it's, it's very well described out what to do but we'll be reaching out to sites over the next uh, couple weeks 
uh, uh, to start this process at a fairly high level uh, to get things going, uh, both for uh, completeness and uh, accuracy. And the other part of this is just to kind of let you guys know, if you watch the website and you see the numbers of surgeons uh, that are a part of this can kind of go up and down as well. I just want everybody to kind of be aware and let everybody know, and, and, and uh, we don't name names or, or put anything out in public, but uh, if surgeons don't put uh, a single patient in for a three-month period, you do get an email from Shelby um, uh, asking what's going on. You get another three-month kind of grace period. So then at the end of six months, if you still have not put a patient in, uh, you get an email from me, uh, and we you know, either have a conversation about what's going on or whatnot. If we don't hear back from you or had changed within a month, then we have removed uh, some services from the collaborative. And obviously, there's a huge financial investment, uh, so we think it's important that we just don't want a, a, a long list of surgeons who aren't actually participating in this. Uh, and, and I think for all those of you who are on there and on the call, obviously this is, you know, this is obviously, you know, news to you guys and, and, and to keep you involved. But I think that just to let you know, I think that for the 166 people that are doing this, they are really active, really engaged. And I think that that is why we really are getting this kind of crucial information that we've never really been able to get um, uh, from, you know, any other collaborative like this before. So I personally just appreciate all the effort. Uh, I know this takes time. I know this takes effort. But but in doing so, it's really allowing us to kind of get to the key questions that we want. I think we're going to have a table, I'm sorry, a seat at the table with CMS now in places that it's just hard to imagine a group of hernia surgeons would ever get to. Um, and then, Ben, it looks like we have a quick question here. You want to um, – there's a question from Intuitive Surgical. Yeah, sure. Um, so the question uh, from Intuitive is, uh, do you have a breakdown of the current volume in different cohorts through June that you could share uh, patients in open lap and robotic cohorts just overall? Uh, and with regards to, let's see, access to data and publications, is there any visibility in the publication or projects that are being pursued with the idea that efforts uh, would not be duplicated by another surgeon? Yeah, good question. Um, as far as breakdown of uh, current volume, uh, yeah, I think uh, for open and lap robotic cohorts, yeah, we can we can provide that to the collaborative. Um, and then, Mike, any comments on the publications? Um, I will just mention that uh, the the public the studies that we are we presented at the AHS are in kind of varying stages of publication, and uh, we're being kind of very careful about. Um, picking those uh, studies that we want to really put our infrastructure behind for publication, but those are certainly on the list. Yeah, I think uh, for the publication perspective, we have a pretty uh, good process in place with our publications committee and how to request that so that we kind of have a running list of, uh, of what's actually going on to really avoid duplication uh, of efforts and data and whatnot. So I think... Um, we're pretty tight on that. I don't foresee that. Um, I do encourage folks, uh, you know, if, if you want to put some academic work into this, number one, we have the research grants. Uh, I think that's actually due next week. Uh, for the, I think it's the 27th or 24th. I can't remember exactly. So I would encourage you, with the re if you have a resident you're working with, submit a research grant. They will be reviewed blinded. Um, and then I think that uh, if you have other things that you're interested in doing, uh, feel free to uh, contact the Publications Committee available on the website, and uh, we have a pretty uh, easy process to do that. I think just kind of keep in mind as you think about your questions and everything, we have much more robust data right now with 30-day follow-up type questions, and as we expand out to long-term follow-up, we'll be able to answer some of those uh, type of questions uh, just in the hopefully not too distant future. Yeah, great. And uh, I just uh, uh, took a look um, on our latest data. 69% of the cases were open. Uh, about 20% were laparoscopic. 19% uh, were laparoscopic, and 9% were robotic. So um, there are your numbers for that. So again, um, just want to say as we wrap up here, congratulations and uh, thanks to patients certainly are the key to all this um, and as we continue to engage them they're 
a big, big part of this, um, all the surgeons involved, all the institutions involved, and also uh, for our foundation partners. Um, we're going to have a, a brief open forum here, but I'm going to close by uh, saying that we hope to see everyone in ACS in October in D.C. Uh, we'll have some more active discussions about this. And again, if anyone has any other thoughts on uh, topics they want to bring up here, let's uh, go ahead and have a brief discussion here. And maybe let me just while people are chiming in, let me just kick off a little bit of this. One of the things that we really, really, really want um, to do is um, is make these kind of when we meet in person, when we do the webinar, incredibly informative and, and rich for you guys with data. So in doing that kind of Ben and I have challenged ourselves to come up with kind of two or three different topics, whether it's the readmission, the, the robotics, you know, whatever that is. So if you guys have specific things uh, that you want to know about coming in October and you're doing all this data, reach out to Ben or myself, and we're going to kind of keep a running list so we can really bring this back so you're excited to come for the presentations. I can just tell you that, um, you know, we'll probably be looking at the effects of epidurals and the effects of tap blocks uh, for uh, ACS. It's just something to think about, but but certainly all that stuff is up for discussion. And if there's things that really kind of get you guys going, maybe it'll be the uh, how you close the skin, because uh, I think it sounds like we all do things a little bit differently. We'll be able to kind of really dig deep into all that information. But anything else that piques your interest, um, it doesn't have to be something that you want to take all the way to a publication. It can just be something that we present at the meeting. Uh, please let us know, and, and we'll kind of dig deep for that. Um, there are a couple of questions about um, ERAS protocols. Um, this has been something about something that we've talked about. That the difficulty is there's so many different components to it, and uh, pretty much not even every hospital is different. Every service line within a hospital institutes a different ERAS protocol. Um, so certainly, if there's interest on tracking ERAS protocols, uh, what we probably have to do is get a couple of interested folks together and really hash out what those components are and list those individual components. I mean, Mike, any thoughts about that? Yeah, I mean, like what you said, you know, I think um, there's a lot of ways that we can break some of this out that we already collect as far as the use of epidurals, the use of a tap block, uh, those type of things. I think um, this always comes into the balance, uh, and there's always a lot of excitement, but then when you kind of break it down into how many extra buttons you have to click and how much extra time it takes for people. We are extremely sensitive and strict about limiting um, the amount of time and effort that surgeons have to commit to putting in this information. So, uh, you know, uh, that's in full disclosure why we often limit some of these things. So we just want to make sure that it's straightforward and easy. But I think that there are creative ways to do this. You know, simply asking the question you do an ERAS, yes or no, would be very few clicks. But as Ben pointed out, I mean, everybody has their own ERAS. So I think, um, you know, uh, there are ways to potentially embed studies within the QC and look at different things that we could kind of evaluate. But, but just always kind of that's the dilemma that we go forward is we really have a two- to three-minute window that we allow surgeons to sit in front of the computer at the time of surgery. Um, and anything past that, although it's great information, we, we, we always kind of weigh upon, is it worth it for the time that, that is put in, since this is not being done by, I think in most centers, research nurses. Yeah, and uh, Sharon had a question about uh, um, tap locks. Uh, she asked, does it count if I am doing it laparoscopically or open versus the anesthesiologist in the PACU or post-op? Uh, short answer is no. It, 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 or short answer is yes, it does count. No, it doesn't matter. Um, the method, the method, or who's doing the tap block um, is is up to you. Um, hey Ben, let me add one other thing for folks too, because a lot of times when I talk to people about this, this comes as a big surprise for folks. So I, I actually just want to take thirty seconds and talk about how to use the website efficiently, uh, because I do all the the patient, uh, you know, history, operative details in my thirty day follow up all by myself. So one quick thing that I have learned, and I don't know if this is just a clinical, a, a clinic phenomenon, or all across everywhere. But uh, Internet Explorer tends to be very jittery with the uh, AHSQC platform. So uh, for me, uh, Google Chrome is much 
more efficient and doesn't uh, those issues. So what I do is every day in the operating room or at clinic, I just they won't let me download it to the computer, but I download it once and then I have it open with the AHSQC and I just revert back to that. So I can tell you Google Chrome has saved me a ton of time to just work through the website. And the second little piece, and I just don't know if everybody knows to do this, but I, I found when I'm in clinic or in the operating room, my secretary already did the kind of name and medical record number stuff. Um, there's a very easy search uh, function that at the top of each column, if you hit the little magnifying glass, you can just put in the patient's last name, the patient's medical record number, and they pop right up. So you don't have to kind of scroll through all the lists. Those features alone, for just me and my own personal efficiency uh, in the management of clinic and the OR, have been huge uh, to do this. And then as far as the timing of it, obviously I do this, I dictate. I, uh, while I'm dictating, I'm going on the HSQC and filling it all out so I don't kind of stack up. I do it before I leave the OR, but that's to each their own. But I think the Google Chrome and the search features are really helpful. Yeah, and I'll also add, um, if you folks have annoyances or you see errors or um, things like that, let us know. We really want this to flow well uh, in, a, in a busy clinical practice. Um, and just email myself, Shelby, or Mike, and uh, we will vet it out and uh, be responsive to you and see if something we can change, which usually we do. So, um, again, I um, just want to wrap things up. Thank everybody for uh, their time this evening, and we really look forward to uh, seeing everyone in October at Washington. Keep up the great work. Uh, we're, we're getting not only the AHSQC on uh, everyone's radar, but the AHS itself. And, um, again, I think it, it really, really goes to show how motivated everyone is to making this a success. Okay, guys, listen, everybody, uh, great turnout, uh, great interaction. Uh, obviously, as I said before, makes me uh, very excited uh, to be a part of this. And uh, I've like seen everybody uh, as engaged and interactive in um, uh, see. All righty. Take care, everybody. Thanks so much.